everybody to the 13th episode of the Playing Games podcast. And today we have a very special guest, Dr. Jordan Shallow. Dr. Shallow, would you like to introduce yourself to everybody? Uh, yeah, hey, what's uh, what's going on, man? Appreciate you having me on. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, as far as what's pertinent to this conversation, uh, I'm a chiropractor, strength conditioning coach, business owner, podcaster, kind of been working in different aspects of the fitness industry, professional sports, medical field for the last uh, probably like about a decade or so. Uh, originally from Canada, went to school in California, did some work in the corporate field, uh, worked at Apple's world headquarters. I worked at uh, NCAA, worked at Stanford University, um, spent most of my days now uh, operating education business in the fitness industry and have a concierge arm of my business where I treat and train professional athletes from tennis players to hockey players to football players, some basketball. And yeah, so that's, that's, that's kind of super, super Coles notes, LinkedIn profile synopsis. I mean, it already gives the fact that you have a lot of experience in what you do. Um, and speaking of California, I'm actually in California right now near San Francisco uh, for Thanksgiving. Oddly, so. oddly enough, that is where I used to live. I used to live in the Mountain View, uh, South Bay area, Silicon Valley, from Palo Alto to Campbell to Los Gatos, uh, Santa Clara. So very familiar. Uh, we are, well, I'm actually going to Campbell tomorrow. I'm in San Jose right now. So it's like 40, 40 I know minutes. It, right? Know it very well. Was there mm, three weeks ago? Oh, that's sick. And where are you? Where are you now? And is it nighttime over there? I think it's. Uh... Uh, so East Coast, yeah. I'm currently based in Toronto. Uh, originally, like I said, from Canada. Um, so just moved home base from Miami to Toronto like two, three months ago. So yeah, I'm currently oh. in Toronto. Oh, cool, cool. All right. Well, um, just to get started, uh, today's main topic or main theme would be about warming up specifically. I've seen so many different uh, ways to go about this, so many different definitions of warming up. And if there's a proper way, if there's a best way, if there's an optimal way or whatever people like to call it these days. Um, I'd like to start off with first defining what warming up really is or how to define a warm up in your, um, I guess, from your perspective. Yeah. I mean, it would be preparation for some sort of higher level physical exertion than baseline something that is the you know demanding of forces being produced or energy systems being taxed outside of homeostasis i think that would probably be as broad spec and you know as hopefully um, apt a an analogy as i think or as a, a comparison as i think you can make so yeah it's it's really preparation but now that depends on who's preparing for what really. And I think that's where a lot of the minutiae around the specifics is going to come from. So when we talk about superlatives, like, you know, the best or most effective or optimal, it, it really depends on who and what for, right? Like a warm up for me for, uh, you know, just a general resistance training workout versus a warm up for me for a 5k run. It's like, well, I'm, I have a better skill set at one. I have better um, you know, tolerance in certain energy systems in one than the other. And I, I mean, I'm, if for those who are unfamiliar or not watching this on video, I'm probably way better at resistance training than I am at running. So the you know, it's it's always a matter of 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 what and for who is warming up and what is the task. So you know, it's a lot of the the optimality of it comes from understanding the specifics of who you're starting with, what you're starting with, and what you're trying to do with that person. Right. And um, well, that brings me into a question of there is a, I've heard these two different uh, ways of warming up. There's a general warm up, and then there's a specific warm up. And then many people think that um, it's you're into the gym and most what I've seen now is that back then, maybe like a couple of years ago, people would all be about general warm ups where they would spend like 15, 20 minutes doing all these activation drills and all that stuff. But now everyone's into like this whole um, idea of like a specific warm up where they just go in the gym, go into the machine that they're going to start with, and they just kind of do like a pyramid set where they increase the weight gradually and then they just get to their working set right away. So, and then they, it leaves like this kind of like gray area of, is it okay to do both? Is there a place and time for either? Which I think there is, um, but I don't. I don't know if you have any thoughts on this idea where it 
like the best way to warm up is this general warm up or is it this uh, um, specific warm up or is it more of a gray area? Yeah, I mean, it's, it always depends and it's going to always depend on those two factors. Like what is, what is the task you're trying to perform and who is the person trying to perform it? So when it comes to warm up, you know, from a general sense, it's like a general warm up of, uh, I don't know, I don't like these use shoulder, for example, what do we see? People do like arm swings and arm circles and face pulls. It's like, I think the, the net benefit might not come from any single, especially for a general population client doing a, a general warm up. The benefit might be, and there's probably some research to back this up, or there is some research to back this up with those exercises in particular, which are you know, relatively inane and you know ineffective but still stimulus nonetheless and that stimulus will be relatively more or less effective to someone who's better or worse off as far as their uh you know baseline strength goes like arm circles for someone who's considerably weak relative to their body weight it's a completely different stimulus than arm circles for someone who has 20 inch arms it's like you have 20 inch arms and you're doing lateral raises with 70 pound dumbbells it's like well your arms are way stronger than the forces of gravity acting on them. So an arm circle is a different stimulus for someone who has really strong arms as opposed to someone who has really weak arms, right? Like a box jump is something absolutely insane for someone who's really, really weak and really, really overweight. But a box jump for you or I is, you know, a relatively easy task. So, um, you know, the general warm up approach as long as it increases and this is where warming up actually kind of loses its namesake uh benefit is like as long as it increases your core body temperature it's probably fine by any means necessary if you have like fairly general goals and you're not attempting to target specific muscles like you know parts of your pec or parts of your lats or uh, you know, parts of your hamstrings or adductors or something and like you might not need some sort of specific positional cue. And for most of the people who are weaker than the forces of gravity acting on them, it's like, yeah, get your heart rate up by any means necessary. And you're probably going to be in a better, more prepared position from, uh, you know, both biomechanically and, you know, likely metabolically or, or physiologically. So, you know, without defining the criteria of who is attempting to do what the warm up conversation is kind of like, it will always bifurcate into those two data points and then how we assess for uh, the differences that we can actually equate when it comes to warming up. Like, you know, there's only so much change in position of a rib cage that we can make in a warm up um, before getting into the actual meat and potatoes of the exercises that we're warming up for. So it's, you know, it, it's an, it's a infinitely, um, uh, you, you know, it's, it's infinitely, I don't want to say infinitely complex because the principles that govern the decision-making process, I think are quite easy, but, uh, it's, it's, inf it's infinitely, um, uh, you know, the outcomes are quite literally infinite because you're going to have different variables of people who are at a starting point and different tasks that they're preparing for. So it's like without defining terms, it's really hard to kind of go straight down the center of the pipe. I think the useful thing would be, well, how do we, what are the terms that we're looking to define? What are the exclusion criteria that are going to give us um, a clear snapshot of who might need what type of intervention? So, and then as far as the specific warm up of just doing the same thing over and over again, it's like, well, that could work if you're a more advanced lifter, if you're someone who has, you know, an, uh, a, a, a good exercise program that has a lot of variability of loaded movements through different planes. If you're someone who doesn't have previous injury, if you're not someone who has uh, repetitive movements, if, like I said, if you're someone who is getting exposed to a lot of different um, uh, planes of movement and vectors of, of resistance or load, sure, I think that might be the goal for people at the end of the day is to be able to just walk in off the street and just start doing pull-ups and push-ups and bench press and all that, which is like, sweet. I think that's a pretty good mark to set. But most people, I think, lack a ton of variability. They lack a ton of skill and exercise. Um, and they, they might set to benefit to learning some of the more minute movement skills that we often attribute to a warm-up, how to, you know, how to retract your shoulder blade or how to protract your shoulder blade or how to rotate your thoracic spine or how to internally rotate your hip. These are all like micro skills that we kind of take for granted as people who are maybe a little bit more, um, you know, further along in, in, our, in our fitness journey or however you want to word it. 
um, but might be something super useful to teach. I right? think like if I was to teach you how to play piano, it's like I'm going to teach you the notes on a on a on a on a piece of paper on a staff paper with five lines and a treble clef or a bass clef, and then I would associate, you know, a note on that line to a finger on a uh, a key, and then you know when you see this circle between this line, that means put your finger on this key, and then you get to a point where this stuff starts to be autonomic and and starts to you know you've learned that skill and the movement's very similar to that and there's a skill acquisition process that happens in movement which i think if you're a trainer or someone prescribing exercise we can look at warm-ups and as like almost learning the theory cognitive and association of some of the more um movements micro movements some of these movement notes that we learn aforementioned scapular depression or upward rotation or you know um, retraction or internal rotation of the hip or external rotation of the shoulder or flexion of the trunk or lateral flexion, any, 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 any sort of single plane movement at a joint that you could do in isolation. We're going to need those if we start to integrate those movements as part of larger, more complex movements like a squat or a deadlift or a bench press or a pull up or whatever. So I, I think there's, there's definite utility for those people who are relatively unskilled to maybe have a more general warm up, but general I wouldn't use, I mean, sticking off of the words that you use, I wouldn't use the word general because general just means like I do a bunch of random shit. And I think everyone has like a fairly unique movement signature that if we're trying to be expedient in our process and having people learn motor skills faster, we could probably identify some key motor skills that they're lacking at their base and also key motor skills that they'll need for the tasks they're about to perform. And that's where I think warming up becomes like, you know, as it should be as, uh, you know, I don't want to say scrutinized, but as thought out as the rest of the exercise prescription process. So in, in a way, it could be thought that this goal of um, kind of just going to the gym and getting into the movements of this specific warm up, it could be kind of like a goal that you can lead up to through this, I guess, general warming up sense where it's like, you don't always have to go to the gym and just go straight into the movement, but it's something that or it's a goal that you can kind of have attributed to yourself and say, maybe it would be nice to get there and kind of already be comfortable with these movements. And my body should already know how to move itself by then. And then you could do that by doing like these micro movements and helping your way build up to that kind of point. Yeah. And it's like, you know, movements have various degrees of complexity, right? Like I don't think people need a warm up to do a bicep curl. Like you, you have to be fairly deconditioned to, you know, and a seated machine preacher curl need a warm up for that. Now, is that the best way to organize an exercise structure? It's like, I'm sure there's a use case somewhere that might benefit from having a seated machine preacher curl uh, as the first exercise. I can't think off the top of my head of a time within the last decade where I've likely programmed that. And if I was programming a decade ago, probably wasn't writing very good exercise programming. Um, but that being said, it's like, you know, a pull up it's higher skill movements tend to find themselves at the beginning of a workout where, um, and there's, there's really good research on this as far as like, you know, fatigue help, helps or not helps fatigue offsets joint sense and joint position, right? Like our, 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 uh, our sensory component of muscle fatigues alongside our output component of muscle. So it's like we need our sensory component of muscle to help us with kinesthetic awareness, appropriate perception and timing and rhythm coordination and all of those things that are more uh, required of us when we do multi-joint complex movements you know, like a squat and, or pull up or um, you know, a standing barbell overhead press or something where there's a bunch of joints that are doing a bunch of different things and we need a certain level of kinesthetic awareness or proprioception, whatever your preferred word is. So we're likely going to start with those things first. Um, and again, so like warming up, it needs to be taken into consideration of what it is we're warming up for. And then we start to get into a broader conversation around, well, exercise prescription at large, um, because you can have a great warm up. But if your first exercise is a seated preacher curl, it's like unless you're entering into a seated preacher curl competition, it might not be the best choice of your first exercise. Um, and then we can start to appraise the uh, efficacy and uh, um, effectiveness of you know the movements that you're putting within a session, which I think will at the end of the day have a much larger impact on not only like some of the micro skills and macro skills of movement, but it really are gonna be the things that move the needle of your progress both in an increasing range of motion, improving mobility standpoint, and obviously improving uh, whatever it is your desired outcome is, whether it's like losing body fat or gaining muscle or building strength. Um, 
so yeah, but again, I think a warm up is is the conversation should be as specific to the individual as the rest of the workout is, and some of that specificity can be what negates a warm up from taking place in the first place. But I think it's definitely worth a conversation depending on the individual skill level. And that actually leads me to my next kind of um, uh, question, in, in a sense. If um, many people think that, uh, and even I used to, I guess, be a part of this, where I would think that I would try to make the best warm up necessary, like a warm up that would always work, uh, no matter what I do, like it incorporates all the planes, all the different rot joint rotations that you can do, and then it will lead like perfectly and smoothly into the into the workout. And and I did try to make that, and I used to, you know, train, or I mean, I'm a personal trainer. It expired like three days ago, but, um, I would try to do that with, with the clients and have like this perfect warm up that fits everybody. But, and then even I realized for myself, like there would be some days where that warm up just feels like absolute shit. Like some days it feel great. Other way, other days it won't. And then I have to try something else. And it, sometimes I feel like it can also, the warm up can come down to how you're feeling that day and maybe what's your past or maybe the stress you've had that week could change some factors. I don't know if you have any ideas on that. Yeah, I mean, I think getting back to our original uh, definition of a warm up, it's like, you know, some sort of preparedness, but the question can be preparedness for what? And there's a bit of flexibility in moving the goalpost on both ends, right? Like, you know, I, I think that it's, I think an, maybe if there was a takeaway from this, uh, as far as um, something that's universal across warm ups, at least I think, is warm ups as far as a series of exercises or movements or planes that we're working through prior to, you know, the, the more resisted conventional exercises that we're going to load and progress over time, they should be integrated with said exercises. I always make the comparison of like um, a four by 100 relay, right? So you have like a runner off the blocks, he's carrying a baton. And as he approaches the, his hundred meter, the handoff point, the second runner is already in motion. So like, I like to organize a more complex movement in circuit or I guess in series with, no, I guess in circuit would be the way I'd want to word it. So in circuit with some of the more minute, finite micro movements that we often associate with warm ups. Like, what does this look like? Um, yeah, I don't know. Like people like face pulls or people like band pull aparts. And I'm not v validating the efficacy of any of those exercises, just something you see a lot. And if it's something that people can resonate with pull aparts, face pulls and cable external rotations or something along those lines for the shoulder. And it's like, okay, that's your shoulder warm up. Great. Cool. Great. Do that. And then do your first set of, um, I don't know, your seated cable rows or depending on your skill level, pull-ups or bent over barbell rows and super light empty bar or really low on the cable stack. And then go back and do those pull aparts and face pulls and external rotation on the cable. If I think I got that right. Do them again. And then do a slightly heavier ascending warm-up set. So it's like you're kind of getting the skill that you're attempting to hopefully prepare for and improve upon and integrate some of these more, you know, micro finite movement skills that, that you're practicing in the warm-up. You're integrating those in real time against the objective outcome of the thing we're actually trying to prepare for, right? Like the barbell row or the pull-up or the cable row or whatever. Um and so now you have a proxy to make decisions. So if you go through a round of that, your client, you know, it's the weekend and they slept nine hours and they've had three meals and been playing with their kids all day. It's like, Hey, I feel really great. Great. Looks like it's moving. Well, let's stop with the warm up and start with the workout. But, you know, I just got off a 15 hour flight from Tokyo and uh, I didn't sleep well and I haven't eaten and I got sick when I was overseas. It's like, okay, well, we, we can move the goalposts. We can do a few more of these rounds integrated. And we can also move the goalposts on the other side where we can actually change the first exercise as a consequence of your inability to perform some of these more minute micro tasks. So a bent over barbell row moves to a uh, chest supported dumbbell row or a chest supported T-bar row or something like that. Where it's like, hey, you really can't control your spine and space. Makes sense. You're dehydrated. You haven't eaten. You got sick. You haven't been sleeping. Your ability to... Uh, you know, co-contract muscles with the spine and pelvis and simultaneously extend the shoulder and flex the elbow. There's a lot going on in a, you know, a, a, an organism that is not really in an optimal prepared state for movement. Let's move the demand on that organism to something a little bit more achievable. Uh, and then that way we can at least get some high effort work in on something that's a little bit more output and a little bit less uh, unstable or a little bit more unstable. 
or no, a little bit less unstable. Um, and then, so a warm up can afford us that. It's it's a really good window into the um, the the neurological and physiological starting line of a workout. And if the starting line needs to be moved up, or the starting line is consistent, we have these little things that allow us to check in on subjective interpretation of like performance, how things look. Um, and then that'll allow us to correlate to really objective outcomes of, you know, can we actually push more weight or more reps or more sets on this particular exercise? So I think it's, it's, it's a double edge, it's a double edged sword, or it should be looked at through two lenses of like, we can always do more warming up if we need to and push the workout back or change the workout in response to it. And we can always, uh, bring the workout forward as far as like, hey, this is all moving well and feeling good. Great. I have those two components of subjective and objective. Let's only do one round of this. And or in some cases, we do no rounds and we feel good and we keep going and we have this specific warm up that's just the exercise and we get a lot of the variability and exposure to planes of motion through a ton of different types of exercises that we do and we continue to do and we get exposure through throughout a training week. Um, and then we can do that and sometimes it doesn't feel good and then we deploy a quick warm up and we deploy that warm up until things either feel good or and we continue on with the plan as planned or they don't feel good and we move the goalposts and change the first exercise so that they do feel good so yeah and um on top of that i'm familiar with when it comes to kind of <clears throat> figuring out a warm up, uh, you have this concept of mobility, stability, and strength. Did I say that in the right order? Got it. <clears throat> right. And um, so I'd like to get a little more into that if we could define those terms and how we can kind of make a warm up surround or around that kind of um, idea. Uh, yeah, sure. So mobility is, you know, active range of freedom of movement, different from flexibility, which is passive range of motion. So uh, for those listening, how would you differentiate the two? Uh, if I were to do a seated hamstring stretch and like reach to grab my toe, kind of a convention, the conventional term would be called a modified hurdler stretch, uh, as opposed to doing an active straight leg raise, the hamstring stretch, modified hurdler stretch would be hamstring flexibility. And an active straight leg raise would be, you know, hamstring mobility, right? So my mobility into active hip flexion is different than my flexibility into passive hip flexion. So that's you know, worth differentiating just so we can put mobility as active range uh, instead of passive and differentiate it from flexibility, which oftentimes those two things get conflated. Uh, and then stability and strength are pretty easy. The ability to exert force is being strength and the ability to resist force being stability and you know, the mobility, stability, and strength is, you know, it's, it's a moniker and it's trademarked with the company and all that fun stuff. But really it's like, you need to have transient access to more quote unquote unstable joint positions to elicit a stability response. Now, what is a stability response? And this is where a lot of people lose the plot. So there's, you know, someone in a hyper academic crowd might say, well, there's no such thing as stabilizer muscles. And I would 100% agree with you are the muscles we have are the muscles we have. However, muscles, like I mentioned before, have a motor output component, which is kind of the hyper focus of resistance training, but they also have a sensory input component, which is, you know, these are, uh, without getting too deep into the uh, neuromuscular physiology, these are muscle fibers that are non-contractile by nature, but they're actually, they're relaying joint sense and position, uh, which are super important, especially at the limbs. Uh, not that, I mean, they're it's so important when it comes to the spine as well. Uh, and so stability is really about having a muscle contraction that is reactive at the level of the, the sensory input of the muscle, not proactive from you know, the pre and primary motor cortex. So voluntary versus involuntary movement. So uh, let me make this real life for people. Uh, common uh, warm up that people do are like leg swings. You know, you go to a squat rack and they do leg swings front and back and they do leg swings side to side. And it's like, okay, they hang on to the squat rack. Now that's, you know, we could look at that as some sort of active mobility drill, but it's not a stability drill. You're holding onto a squat rack, your base support is far exceeds your ability to get your center of mass outside of it. So you're very stable while you're doing it. You're holding on to a thing that's bolted to the ground. What might be a better solution, or at least an adjunct, something you can add to that, is like if I do like a single leg RDL, now I have 
you know, as I hinge forward on one leg, the muscles that contract at my hip, as far as keeping not, you know, not hip flexors or anything like that, like lateral rotator group or piriformis or glute meat or you know, um, obturator, internus, externus, whatever, name any of the hip rotators that you want. Those muscles, when I stand on one leg, they're contracting reactively from the sensory input component of those muscles, right? So as I stand on one leg and my foot kind of looks all shaky, all of that is my body trying to now autonomically contract and relax muscles so that I can keep my center of mass over my now limited base support. So as I go into hip flexion extension, very similar to what I was doing in, an, in a, um, you know, a leg swing front to back, it's eliciting a completely different muscle contraction. Our leg swing is voluntary and starts with my brain going like, hey, you know, with your TFL and your rec femoris and your psoas and your iliacus, flex the hip and then relax it. And with your glute, your adductor, and your hamstring, extend the hip in the opposite direction. It's all happening up here in your pre and primary motor cortex. But when you're doing it with one leg on the ground and it's loaded and it's closed chained and you're going through flexion, extension, and rotation of a fixed femur, the contraction as that allows you to stay stable, which by definition is keeping your center of mass over your base support, that's being elicited. And again, it's contraction and relaxation. Those That reflex is happening local at the level of the muscle itself. Now, not to say that a glute med has any different of a physiological property uh, than any other muscle. It's not necessarily a stabilizer muscle. It's just usually put in a position where its, its contractions are autonomic and its relaxations are autonomic. They're, they're local reflexes at the level of the muscle itself and not these global voluntary uh, you know, uh, outputs from the central nervous system of the brain. Like if you were to do like monster walks or banded hip abduction, things that are more conscious and voluntary moving insertion from origin. These they don't really care about moving insertion from origin. They care about keeping the center of mass over the base support. We have like a very sophisticated system that runs on the back end to keep us stable. And so the nice part is, you know, as we integrate exercises that can elicit this type of involuntary reflexive contraction that we would call stability in its simplest form, as it is trying to keep us center of mass over our base of support, our body helps that helps our brain plot where these joints are in space. They're sensory receptors. You can think of it a little bit like uh, an internal motion capture system. So if you've ever played like a sports video game, like FIFA or NBA 2K, whatever, you know, the athletes and their ability to be replicated in their movements on the court on a computer screen happen by way of this software hardware combination called motion capture, where a court, where an athlete would go onto a court on a soundstage and they would have, uh, you know, the uh, suit with a bunch of sensors on it. And that sensor would, those sensors would feed into a, you know, a central processor or a computer. And then the computer would be able to, given the number of like little trans transmitters on the suit, be able to transmit relative positions of hand and fingers and wrists and elbows and shoulders. So you can start to get like a pretty good idea of like, you know, how a free kick is performed with all the joints in the body or how a free throw or how dribbling looks in this kind of two-dimensional digital rendering and then from there this the hardware and the or sorry the software and the computer can start to layer on you know different skin colors and different jersey colors and then you have all these different players that are represented as video games we have a system like that in our own body and the transmitters that move the signal of joint sense and, and position in space to the brain are, you know, some of these sensory organs within the muscle. And there's others, right? There's some that are in our skin, some that are in our joints, but the most important, and there's, there's good research on this, um, uh, are these, you know, the sensory organs within muscles themselves. So it's, you know, as we look at a warm up and we look at maybe some of the long-term goals, it's about really understanding or having a client or yourself be able and aware of understand where your body is in space. If you know where your body is in space, you can kind of go anywhere and do anything, right? Like if I'm, if I know where I am currently in Toronto and I need to get somewhere, it's like, well, that's the prerequisite to knowing to where I want to go. Cause if I don't know where I am and I go to Google maps or I go to Google flights and I want to say like, I want to go visit you in California. It's like, well, if I don't know where I am, how the hell am I going to get to California? Do I go north? Do I go south? I don't know. I don't know where I am. And well, that's true in a lot of cases, obviously metaphorically, but you know, the principle reigns true with people and teaching them movement. It's like, well, you can't teach someone how to know where to go if they don't know where they are. And most people's little internal 
um, motion capture system is like really, really outdated and really, really flawed because we've never trained the sensory input component of their muscle. Uh, so there's some basic exercises we can do. And over the long term, these basic exercises can turn into more loadable exercises. But the goal is like, can we give someone, you know, kinesthetic awareness of where their body is? Because if I can tell you where you are, and then it's way easier for me to tell you where, where and how to get to where you want to go. So teaching skills of like, whether it's a pull up, whether it's a squat, whether it's lunges, you know, on a really archaic outdated you know software hardware system of like hey you don't know where you are in space i'm going to start with that first so when we look at warm-ups it's like you know the goal is probably to create or at least screen for does this person know where they are in space like can you stand on one leg can your body tell you with real relative accuracy and accuracy being measured by the ability to keep center of mass over base of support where you are and if you can't it'll tell you because you'll fall over but if it can tell you, you won't fall over. It's like, oh, I know where your hip is. I know where your knee is. I know where your ankle is. And I can contract very you know, finitely to what degree I have to to keep our combined center of mass over our limited base support. Great. So to kind of get back to the original framework of the question, which is like, can you define where mobility, stability, and strength fall into and define them relative to one another? It's like, so mobility is active range. We need mobility to get into unstable positions. Right. Like if I don't, if I can't get into active hip flexion, I can't really displace my center of mass over my base of support. If I'm talking about a single leg aerial. So maybe, you know, not that this is the solution long term and not that tight hamstrings are the thing that's stopping you from getting into a single leg RDL. But maybe if I do some sort of hamstring stretch, it'll transiently improve awareness and position. And it's a different receptor that's doing that. Not as, not as uh, prevalent or pronounced the Golgi tendon organ for those of you who kind of can follow along with the, the neuro the, the neuromuscular physiology but still something that will give us a little bit of awareness to then get into a single leg rdl so we can you know if you're going to organize some form of static stretching there's pretty good research on maybe not having that directly before a bout of exertion or some sort of strengthening exercise but bridging the gap of like some sort of passive or active flexibility or mobility drill with a stability drill which is going to not be inhibitory by nature which is actually going to be you know excitatory and contractile and, and force muscles to contract rather than forcing them to relax hopefully with the pairing of mobility drills allowing us to get into more unstable positions we're actually going to demand more muscle contraction with our stability drills which will create more awareness around the joints that we are ultimately attempting to train uh you know with higher levels of of, of load and, and trying to drive more mechanical tension and most people are probably just trying to put on muscle if if uh if my assessment of general population fitness goals is correct um so that's kind of how it works. I mean, mobility, stability, strength, it's a, it's a good little moniker. It's something I'm glad we've patented or trademarked internationally. But at the end of the day, it's kind of just like a, it's an order of operations of like, if you want to improve joint sense long term, you might want to f kind of follow that little framework of like, you know, have the have the mobility to get into unstable positions because that's going to elicit a greater reflexive contraction and improve your awareness of your body's position in space. And then once you've done that, you're going to kind of have this internal stability, this ability to resist force at joints, which is then going to allow you to, you know, exert more force, be stronger, drive more output, whatever, whatever term you'd like to designate to it, right? Like why is it that I'm uh, stronger on uh, I don't know, a leg press versus a squat. Well, there's a lot of reasons, obviously, you know, you do like a 45 degree angle of the load that's being applied to it. Number one, but when you equate for all things equal, I don't have to organize muscle contractions to stabilize my pelvis and my spine and my shoulder blades and my rib cage is I'm sitting in a giant chair. Well, it's like, well, what if when I was on that giant chair, I actually had muscles that were assisting internally to stabilize, you know, the pelvis and the spine and the shoulder blades and the rib cage just as the leg press itself was stabilizing externally. Well, it's more stability, more output. And that's kind of what we're after, right? So mobility, stability, strength, it's kind of an order of operations. But at the end of the day, it's like, look, if we can start to accrue some of this mobility and improve our stab stability long-term, then yeah, like to get back to the previous question, it's like, well, we could just walk into the gym one day and just start doing pull-ups and squats. And it's like, you know, that's, 
that's the goal. If you've improved your mobility long term to have access to ranges that you can have joint sense in and control over and be stable in. And then once you get strong in those ranges, then your body is you know, more or less aware of how to move in the in and out of the positions uh, that you're asking them to get into. And uh, then warm ups just become specific of like, well, are there ranges of motion that you're attempting to get into with new tasks or new training goals that uh, you haven't in the past? Well, what are those planes? How can we improve mobility and stability into those planes first and then start to layer in strength uh, as, as almost a byproduct of that after? So, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's I think it's really more of a, a systems way of thinking about the way the body moves um, if we're kind of just trying to summarize mobility, stability, and strength. I think, um, I think within that answer, you answered um, one of the things I was curious about of how some muscles, where I've heard this before, where some muscles are more made to tolerate force while others are more made to generate force. I don't know if that's the right way to put it, um, but like like you mentioned, like I think it comes down to the, um, uh, the, the action that it's trying to, or the task that it's being put under. Right. So, for example, the rotator cuff is awfully seen as a stabilizer muscle or the core, for example, is often seen as a muscle to tolerate force. Or, I mean, some people say it's because of its aligned uh, physiology and the structures of it. But um, I think under a certain tasks, they could also be put under positions to generate force. Is that correct or? Yeah, I mean, it's all about position, right? The reason that like if you think of the most common muscles that are uh, labeled as stabilizers, they're usually in biped ambulatory creatures. They are usually muscles that are running from east to west, not north to south. So, you know, piriformis, transverse abdominis, and infraspinatus, let's use that as kind of sentinel stabilizer muscles that are often, you know, designated to, um, how do we do this? Hip, spine, and shoulder. So, infraspinatus at the shoulder, transverse abdominis at the spine and piriformis at the hip. If you look at the muscle fiber orientation at, of those three muscles, well, someone is standing upright. It's running north to south. Well, where does gravity running? Well, gravity run, is run, oh, sorry, they're running east to west. Gravity is running north to south. So it's like, you know, these muscles aren't like a hamstring or a bicep uh, or a quadricep, which are running north to south in opposition always of gravity that's also running north to south. So they're not under the same, they're not in the same position. So they're not under the same physiological demand. But usually what they are doing is they're playing more of a sensory role. Uh, and we're using some of those more, um, uh, and I'm going to use the word sensitive after using the word sensory, but we're using the, the sensitive, uh, <coughs> what are called interfusal muscle fibers that are autonomically regulating for length and general tone of these muscles to help keep in alignment the muscles that are running against the plane of gravity. So a lot of it just has to do with position. And yeah, we can, you use the word task, which I would 100% agree with. There are tasks that we can do where these muscles are now predominantly being asked to exert force over resist force. But the thing that all of these tasks will have common to them is that they will change the orientation or the relative uh, relationship of gravity with these muscles um, and that's what will define some of these exercises um, and now change and now here's here's the best part if you're challenge like let's say you're doing uh, rope crunches it's not as if there's not a sensory component to that it's not as if it's a zero-sum game that something can be all sensory or all motor output for most people like you know they can probably gain a lot of benefit on the sensory side from training more direct core work. Oh, I feel it. Great. Cool. Awesome. That's a, a goal. We like feeling things. And guess what? That feeling that comes from challenging muscles directly will only help that muscle and the awareness of that muscle and its importance in this case with the rectus abdominis of understanding the relative position and orientation of the pelvis and the rib cage. It will only assist in that awareness long term. So it's not as if if we train muscles to be strong, it's, it's long-term that's going to affect our ability um, to, or, or detract necessarily from our ability for those muscles to be sensitive and stable. It's just, you know, it's, sometimes you're going to have to just pay attention a little bit more to this thing you're not paying attention to. 
for people who are always doing like the really, really strong thing. It's like, okay, you can do a rope crunch with the entire stack, but you can't do a plank for 30 seconds. It's like, that's a problem. Our strength is outrun our stability. We might just want to pay attention to that, right? So our ability to resist force should always just be, it's a system check. We should always be checking in on it. Like, you know, I no doubt you got on a plane from, I don't know, Fort Lauderdale to SFO or SJC, San Jose Mineta, one of the airports. Um, and, you know, before you took off, your pilot would have done a systems check. We're going to check communications. We're going to check instrumentation. We're going to check, uh, you know, we're going to check each individual engine. Um, and, you know, sometimes pilots, they do run those checks and they go, oh, fuck, uh, the landing gear, there's an issue. Hold on. We've got to get maintenance over. It's going to be 45 minutes. Please hold. And that's kind of what like a warm up can be. It's like, well, hold on. Like we don't have, you know, we don't have the ability to stabilize as we internally rotate the femur. It's like, oh, well, that's a problem. Yeah, it's a problem because if you're going to squat, you're going to want to be able to stabilize your femur as we internally rotate it. It's a systems check. And then sometimes you can check that system and be like, it's good. It's like, all right, get this bitch in the air. And then off you go. So it's, you know, it, it's, um, uh, you know, deviating it away from the core of your question. I think it had something to do. Um, um what was your last question i totally forgot uh this, 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 this happens uh it was just i mean it was more so just a general way of thinking of uh if a muscle has always made mm. for a specific task on uh no stability generating or tolerating force You're right 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 yeah no the, I mean, the thing that is common of the muscles that we that people designate as stability muscles is they're commonly in positions where they're not opposing gravity directly. So they're usually more, they're usually getting taxed more, not taxed more, but usually being used more as a, as a uh, part of, you know, the joint sense complex that includes proprioception, mechanoreception, in some cases, nociception. Um, and, you know, they're not major tools of propulsion. How could something that goes perpendicular to the joint that we're attempting to move through space, how could that be a major component of propulsion? It's not a major, it's a minor. It's making sure that the major contributions to propulsion are in positions to be major contributions to propulsion, right? My lateral hip is meant to keep my femur in a relative orientation to my uh, pelvis and tibia so that my hamstrings or adductors or glutes can be effective tools of you know very efficient locomotion and that's kind of what they're doing now we can change the orientation or change the relationship to resistance or gravity so that they then become primary um, so it's not about sensory muscles and oh we have all these little stabilizer muscles it's like no you know there's some muscles that show higher concentration of these sensory organs but by and large and the unique thing is that there's none in our face which is cool because i don't think yeah, yeah, it's it's one of the things that I find stupid about the jaws or size thing is that like well, we're not even getting a sensory benefit because there's none to be had because we don't have these free nerve endings in muscles of the face. But yeah, it's about task. And I think the thing, if we dig a little bit deeper about task itself, it, it comes down to what is the position of the task. And a lot of times you're going to see when we are training these muscles that are more often earmarked as stability muscles, when we train them more for strength, all we're doing is changing their position relative to gravity or resistance and that could uh change their uh um their want their ability to want to either prove uh move origin to insertion or rather just stabilize the muscles that are moving origin to insertion right yeah yeah i mean if we're putting if we're putting tension through fibers and asking things to move from insertion to origin it's like those things are going to succumb to mechanical tension and more importantly the those muscles, those muscle contractions are going to be voluntary, right? Like if I'm doing a bicep curl, I'm voluntarily contracting my bicep. Now, like, you know, maybe muscles of my anterior delt or maybe muscles of my, like my lower trap or oblique or serratus are attempting to keep my scapula or humerus and scapula in a relative position to best challenge my bicep. When I flex my bicep and, and a bicep curl, there are contractions of other muscles, deltoid primarily, right? If we think about, if I hold a really heavy dumbbell in my hand and I'm about to curl it, my deltoid is contracting reflexively so my arm doesn't fall out of my body. Um, so, but that's autonomic. I'm not flexing my delt on purpose. It's, it's, it's flexing as a, as a reflex loop, a local reflex loop. What I, so the contraction at my delt is different than the contraction at my bicep. 
the contraction of my bicep is voluntary and that comes from you know your pre and primary motor motor cortex and your parietal lobe and you know deeper structures of your uh, of your brain topography that we could get into but um, but my delta is is it's direct feedback loop from sensory input it's getting from the delta itself the delta is lengthening why because there's a dumbbell in my hand that's pulling my shoulder out of my socket and my delta would begin to lengthen and there's parts of the sensory component of the deltoid that is speaking directly back to the deltoid. This is, hey, contract to keep the humerus in place so we can complete the task at the elbow. Um, so I think it's really worth understanding those two different types, uh, types, I'll air quote as an oversimplification, those types of muscle contractions. Absolutely. And uh, well, I mean, going back a little bit, um, nothing to spend too much time in, but I'm kind of glad you mentioned when we were talking about mobility, because um, it's often defined as flexibility plus strength. But you kind of made sure to, uh, or you, uh, you added the ad, uh, you added the fact that it's actually an active, um, you're, you're moving through an active range, not necessarily a passive range, because flexibility, there's multiple time, there's multiple terms to uh, stretching and stuff like that. Yeah, I tend to not agree with that as a definition. I think that's going to set people up to probably do more harm than good. I think if you look at mobility as flexibility with strength, then mobility work becomes dangerous. Dangerous. It's and, exercise. It's and, not dangerous, but like loading, loading end ranges of motion where people are inherently weak in their muscular structures and then will ultimately have to load into their soft tissue structures. Doing that in ways where then if you get into like resistance profiles, doing that in ways where you're trying to be strong with... Uh, and maybe a higher peak of resistance as far as a particular exercise in a weaker position at a fully lengthened position, which if we're talking about mobility being uh, what I think to be a very bastardized understanding of it would be uh, uh, flexibility plus strength. Yeah, like and not to say don't do that. Like if you want to get hurt, be a 15 year old girl that plays soccer. That's probably the most likely thing you can do to uh, improve the odds of somebody getting hurt while doing physical activity. Like things we do in the gym are like very, 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 very safe. Very safe. Um, but if I were to like have to try, like if I had a mortal enemy that I was trying to hurt in the gym, I would probably approach my ethos with like, oh, mobility is flexibility plus strength. It's like, no, it's, no, it's not. Um, yeah, I, I used to think of it that way. And I, I mean, I wasn't saying uh, the big picture of it. I, I definitely think that it helped me put more of a, I think warmups are better when they have an idea behind it rather than just going in and like, all right, well, I'm just going to move this and then I should be good. Um, that being said, uh, I know you are pretty big uh, on moving the rib cage when it comes to, I guess, you know, part of your warming up or understanding movements. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on that? If that means like moving your spine or how can we go about moving the rib cage? Is it just like natural movements going against gravity or can we use them in movements like a pull-up where there requires a lot of stability of the rib cage? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it depends, right? Like what is the starting position of the person, especially when it comes to the rib cage? Like there's, there's kind of two bookends that we see from a structure function relationship, right? There are people who are like very barrel chested and, you know, this is usually more true of people who are, uh, we don't want to overgeneralize people who are overweight who carry the center of mass forward and overweight could mean like, you know, really big bodybuilders or, you know, people who are, um, just new to fitness and, and overweight, not strong. Um, so it, it depends on, uh, you know, where you move a rib cage, is only beneficial if you know where people lack movement at the rib cage, right? Like if you just start like swinging your rib cage around, it's like, oh, well, yeah, maybe like you might benefit from something. And if, if I need to give a general prescription without any information to how to warm up a rib cage for exercise and like you're going to constrain me to like, I'm not going to give you any information. It's like, okay, I'm going to get someone's heart rate up because you know what moves the rib cage? Breathing breathing because there's lungs underneath the rib cage so we're just going to get the lungs moving and that'll probably benefit everyone's rib cage specifics around you know biomechanical air quote stupid word biomechanical interventions or more specific interventions at the rib cage going to depend on where they lack motion right most people do thoracic extension 
They don't lack motion and thoracic extension. They're actually already there. So, you know, I'm not going to introduce foam rolling the thoracic spine for someone who has a already abruptly extended thoracic spine and whose rib cage is forward in space. I might want to more specifically push that person's rib cage back in space and give them some sort of thoracic. We wouldn't use the term thoracic um, flexion. We'd use the term rib cage expansion, um, which would mean like, hey, we're actually going to try to drive some air between the shoulder blades and the posterior aspect of the rib cage. And there's ways we can position the body to do that in more efficient in a more efficient manner. But again, when it comes to warming up or moving the rib cage, it really is, you know, what are we warming up the rib cage for and whose rib cage are we warming up? So it kind of falls under the two guiding principles of like the warm up to begin with, because, you know, I can deal with depending on the tasks that we're attempting to perform, I can deal with a, you know, somewhat of a lack of variability of movement in a rib cage. If the plane of motion we're attempting to move the rib cage in isn't a part of the main work of the exercise that we're loading. Um, now, that's rarely the case where those two things uh, coincide, but it's something that you should always, from a heuristic standpoint, be mindful of so you don't just find yourself lazily programming logarithmically if this, then that. So, you know, with rib cage mobility, there's kind of, it's, it's predominantly driven by two factors. It's obviously driven by the diaphragm, which is like an inextricable central muscular link that controls the lower aspects of the rib cage, which are the most malleable portion, portions of the rib cage. And then the most malleable portions of the rib cage because our diaphragm attaches to it, right? We need a rib cage to move around when a muscle that's imperative for us, you know, in inhaling oxygen and it's expelling carbon dioxide. Uh, when that muscle is directly linked to lung function, it's like, well, if our ribs were completely rigid all the way through and we're rigid at the point where the diaphragm attaches, our ribs really wouldn't be good at moving at all. And we wouldn't be really good at taking a deep breath in and driving a lot of air out. So, you know, what does this mean structurally? It means the diaphragm attaches onto, you know, the lower aspects of the rib cage at, you know, the anterior lateral and posterior aspects. So if you're looking at someone from the front, the bottom of their sternum, kind of articulates with their seventh rib and then you follow the false and floating ribs around to the 12th rib articulating with the 12th um, yeah, thoracic spine vertebra and the diaphragm is pretty much just going to trace that entire front to back side to side and so you know moving the diaphragm around is going to be what moves the rib cage around from the inside but, you know, if we understand like a little bit, a little bit about pressure, pressure moves from concentrations of high to concentrations of low, right? That's what a gradient is. So when we look at external musculature that act on top of the rib cage. This helps guide where our efforts and our air go. So like if I contract uh, my rectus abdominis and I take a breath in, it's like, well, the air that wanted to go underneath my sternum and underneath my, you know, upper lower ribs, so like upper lower meaning like this rib seven, eight, nine ish on the anterior aspect. Uh, if I flex my rectus abdominis, I said, well, the air's not going to go there anymore. So where's it going to go? It's like I don't know. It's going to find somewhere else to go. It's going to go into the lateral aspect of the ribs, or it's going to go posteriorly. All right. So it's always a combination of like the, the 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 default of the diaphragm contracting through breathing. And obviously understanding that inhalation is going to contract the diaphragm, create negative pressure of the lungs underneath the rib cage. And that's what brings air in and creates a lot of expansion. And exhalation, when we force it, is going to allow the diaphragm to elevate. And then we're going to, as we force exhalation, demand other muscles that are classified as muscles of force exhalation, obliques and serratus and um, intercostals uh, to, to manipulate the rib cage a different way. So it's like, well, how, where are we lacking movement? Number one, what movement does a rib cage need to have to complete the tasks that we're attempting to perform? Number two, and then how do I manipulate the contraction of the external musculature at the rib cage um, with you know breathing to drive the most amount of air to the places in the rib cage where I need the most amount of movement for the task I'm about to perform? So, you know, multifactorial is always the answer. It starts with an assessment of where they're at, what they don't have, and what they need for the tasks that they're going to be performing. And then how do we manipulate the environment or constrain the environment so that we can get them into these positions they don't have and need uh, in as quick a time as possible. And that gives them variability and allows them to learn skills really quickly as opposed to just not paying attention 
to it and having them just fi- this ultimately succumb to their structure indicating poor function. So it's something that we can, we can manipulate. Yeah, definitely. Um, you definitely uh, like that point of view um, or it's very understandable. Um, I know we're running out of time, but I do want to get over one question and then I want to kind of finish off with maybe you could explain what the level three of prescript is uh, maybe elaborate a little bit. Cause I know a lot of people were questioning or if they were excited about that. Um, for the last question, and this is a, not so much about warming up, but it's still very related, uh, I guess could be kind of somewhat related to it. Maybe not, um, something about athletes where I, it's very common to see a lot of, I guess the best coaches in the world train the best athletes in the world. And the way that they would do that is that they would try to mimic the gym to the field. And then they would try to have do the athlete do exactly what they would do in the field to just with like load. Now, from my perspective, I feel like that completely changes the environment and maybe makes things even worse in a sense. Uh, but I know there's a fine line of how you can train an athlete, but and then also where you could kind of stop that instead of trying to mimic everything you see in the field. Uh, I'm not sure if you uh, know where I'm coming from, or maybe you can kind of elaborate on that fine line of knowing when to not mimic everything that you do in the sport to the gym, because we're in the gym to build capacity, not just to do exactly what we're doing in the field. That's what the sport is for. That's what practicing the sport is for. Yeah. I mean, I would say that the one time, uh, so I'll give the devil his due and say the one time that that might be useful is in some sort of return to play where we have, you know, very controlled environment post injury and getting in and out of positions uh, at, the stimulus as controlled as higher intensities. So if we look at stimulus on a, on a progression, we can look at endurance, intensity, velocity, rhythm, coordination, and timing as incremental steps into mastering, so to speak, a, a particular position or ability to move in and out of position. So people who replicate the field, like so really simply for people who might not be able to follow the train of thought, when people do landmine presses and think I'm going to punch harder, it's not really how it works. It's, it might make sense if you don't think about it. Uh, but when you get paid to think about it, you realize that's yeah, like kind of like you alluded to, it might make things worse. It might, it might ruin the thing, not ruin, but it might not help appreciate the thing that actually makes athleticism, which is not endurance, intensity, or velocity. Although these are attributes of athletes, they are not what make athletes athletes. What make athletes athletes, even endurance, strength, and speed athletes is not their strength, endurance, and speed. Strength, endurance, and speed are byproducts of rhythm, coordination, and timing. It's as much about turning muscles off as turning muscles on. So if I'm going to teach someone who, you know, if I'm working with, I don't know, Francis Ngannou, and I'm trying to improve his punch power, a landmine punch thing is not going to fucking do it. Not by a long time. If anything, it might resequence how he goes through shoulder flexion transiently. You know, it's not like, it's not like he's a plastic and it's going to break his punch, but it's not going to help him because it's going to likely overload the anterior delt. It might overload the serratus. And it's like, well, what are we doing here? It's like, he punches enough. He's probably striking, I don't know, three to five times a week, maybe more in camp, maybe more than seven times a week, multiple sessions a day in some cases. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I always use the comparison and it's a bit of an odd analogy, but I think it actually fits quite nicely. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sampled from robot, a roboticist, um, which helps define human likeness to things that look like humans that aren't humans, right? So if like I'm making a robot, I want people to like it. There's actually a trend of likeness, which means like how how alike does a robot look like a person before we where we, where do we peach where do we reach peak likability and where do we reach the valley of likability and so the principle is called un, the uncanny valley, which is like it, it, I'll, I'll run out in robotics terms first and I'll compare it to exercise second, where it's like you know the analogy or the comparison I'll use is like Wally the Pixar character. It's like kind of a microwave on Mars. It's anthropomorphized, which means like you know it has human-like characteristics, but it's definitely not a human, right? Like it's it doesn't have legs. It's like a microwave on tracks. It I think it has eyes, um, but it doesn't have a mouth. I don't think. Um, 
so people like it, but it's like, yeah, it's cool. It's like, it does its thing and whatever. There's, there's like a story to it and it's Pixar. So, you know, it's going to make a bunch of money. But then if you think about like, well, like minions, like minions definitely look more like people than wall. They got like legs, but like the, one of them's got like a giant eye in the middle of his head, but they wear overalls and they're yellow, but like, I think they have arms, but like, they're definitely not people, but they're definitely more like us than wall. And then if you think about like, I don't know, the Simpsons, the Simpsons have been around for like almost 30 years, almost as long as I've been alive or longer than, no, almost as long as I've been alive. Um, you know, it's large, there's still people and way more people like than Wally, way more people like than Minions. But like, you know, Marge has like three foot long blue hair and like, I don't know, Maggie Simpson's been, I don't know if this is still the case. I haven't watched it in a long time, but like Maggie might still be like three years old. So there's like properties to it that make them very unlike humans. But we like them more than Minions and we like Minions more than so We kind of see this this trend of like, hey, the more things look like us, the more we like them. Except when they get so close to us, but we know they're not us. Like, if you ever seen the movie like Ex Machina or like I Robot, where it's like, wow, okay, these things really start to possess like human features, but aren't humans. We go like, yo, we don't like this at all. And then, so we see the what we call the Uncanny Valley would be the point where we see these things that look like us but are not. And then when we see actual human beings, we're like, oh, we fucking really like actually seeing people, like recognizing real human beings is like yeah our brain likes that a lot more than we like the simpsons so you kind of end up with this like plot graph that goes up 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 starkly drops off and then starkly rises up to its highest peak kind of like exercise right like if we think about exercises that look too close to the thing on the field without being the thing on the field it's like we don't really like it. it slows us down it throws off a rhythm it throws off our coordination it throws off our timing but like, okay, then if we start looking at like, well, what are the Simpsons and what is, what is Minions and what is Wally? It's like, well, you know, the Simpsons might be something that build general attributes of like endurance. So like the fan bike, for example, great, great way at you know low skill, high output, metabolic, fuck you up. Well, that's what if I'm trying to build lung capacity, or if I'm trying to improve, you know, some sort of cardiac output. Dope. I'm going to put someone on that. I'm not going to have them do some long-winded kettlebell circuit that kind of looks like they're grappling with a... It's like, no, they grapple over here and they're going to do the thing that's really good at driving cardio with no skill over here. Or like, I want to build, you know, uh, I want to build uh, increased rate of force development. It's like, I'm going to teach them how to sprint, right? Well, they don't. They might not actually sprint in their sport, but sprinting can still be useful at improving their rate of force development. Or I, I want to improve absolute power, power to power to strength or uh, strength to body weight ratio. It's like, hey, I'm going to do trap bar deadlifts or I'm going to do jumps or I'm going to do plyometrics or something. It's like they might not look like anything in the sport, but they're the things that are going to build the physical properties that sports are then built on. And they're not going to do it in a way that uh, hinders or, or changes the, the, the learning and adapting of you know, the things that they need to be proficient at when it comes to rhythm and coordination and timing. So, you know, it, it, yeah, I'm going to go back to your original statement about the best coaches in, in the world training the best athletes. It's like, <laughs> if the coach is doing dumb shit that looks like the sport with a barbell in their hand, then that's not the best coach in the world. It's a lucky person who works with an athlete, which frankly, and here's kind of the real kicker when you work with really good athletes, uh, John Elway's strength coach once said, my job is to make sure that John doesn't trip over weights in the weight room. So as long as you aren't doing like extra, extra, extra dumb shit and you're around, you know, physically and mentally anomalous creatures that just are one of one, it doesn't really matter what you do. It does. And you can make them a little bit better, but your job is to maybe not make them a lot worse. And luckily for us, dumb shit like punching a landmine isn't going to make... I don't know, uh, Canelo, a worse boxer. This might not make him a better boxer, but he's already really fucking good to begin with. So, like, I don't know. Maybe Canelo Alvarez could do whatever the fuck he wants. I think um, I think the analogy, if you stick to the very end, it starts to come together um, for the people who were kind of, like, listening to it, and then they would be like, where is this going? But and then I like the idea of how it builds up and then drops down. But and then if you do the exact same thing, it's – it shoots back up, uh, which is practicing the sport, I assume. I assume. Um, yeah, to finish off, just because um, we're a little over, uh, maybe could you explain this pre-script level three thing? What makes it uh, 
I guess, so unique or what's something that hasn't, it's something that hasn't been done before or how, how it can bring a coach to really experience, I guess, a practical application from what he's learned or he or she's learned. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously if there's a prescript level three, there's a prescript one and two. So like the one and two courses are, uh, anatomy and uh, functional anatomy and applied biomechanics courses. The level one centers around um, shoulder, hip, and spine. Level two is rib cage, pelvis, nervous system, which gives everyone the. A, if you go through those courses, you have a very good theoretical working knowledge of resistance training of any sort. You can understand um, everything from injury re- rehabilitation to hypertrophy to. Um, basically any anything in between and movement preparation progressions regressions adaptations optimization it's you know it's fairly in depth take it'll take you the better part of jesus probably take you the better part of a you almost a year to get through both of those courses um but you know there's a lot of education and fitness on the internet and the proving ground for me has always been like well can you do it live so i've been lucky enough in my career to be able to work with you know, very, very, and some people would argue some of the best athletes in the world. Um, and there's, there's more to coaching than being an encyclopedia. And I want people who work with our company and our brand, uh, and represent us in the field to be good coaches. And so I didn't want to just have it where you guys come out for a week and, um, we talk about more theory. I thought like, all right, well, let's talk about the soft skills out of the hard sciences and let's do it in a framework to exclude people who might be a little bit nervous that are high stakes. So we've partnered with a close friend of mine, uh, Yo Murphy and who, Yo, um, I've been lucky enough to work alongside in a clinical setting with his comb- NFL combine preparation program from January to February, um, every year. And then his preseason NFL um, camp that he runs. So the coaches are level two coaches who, who get on the list for level three, um, will in the January and February come out and be coaching the, in January and February. It's all NCAA going to the NFL. So they'll be coaching 30 of the best, uh, NCAA athletes who will be household names in the NFL. And we're coaching them to prepare them for the NFL combine. So it's like one thing to know it's, uh, you know, the science and the anatomy and the mechanics, but you know, now we're giving you a proving ground to actually learn how to in real time apply this. And in all honesty, in a lot of cases, it's know when not to apply it, right? When you're dealing with the high stakes, you know, you have an eight week program to get someone in the best shape of their life and that could change their life. It's like, you think, you think about, what cues become necessary or what interventions become necessary or what progressions become necessary. So it's kind of a, it's a high stakes proving ground to make sure that the coaches that bear our certification are proven and vetted and high stakes situations with the best athletes in the world to be able to actually coach people and not just write programs on the internet. Cause a coach is someone that, you know, you coach an athlete, you program a computer and I'm not on the interest of computer programmers. I'm in the interest of coaching. Um, so yeah, we have our coaches come out and for a week at a time, they're going to work with, uh, you know, like I said, in the, in the, in the, in the winter, we're going to be working with the best, uh, NCAA athletes on, uh, you know, on the planet, really, we will go to the NFL combine at the end of our training program and then get drafted in the following month in the end of April. And then we'll likely most of them start for an active roster NFL team in, uh, you know, that coming October. And then in June, July, our second cohort of L3. Um, so we'll run it twice a year. These guys are going to work with NFL veterans who are preparing to go back into what are called OTAs or organized team uh, activities, which often we just call training camp. Um, so yeah, you're going to have guys who are, one, you're going to have guys in comp who are drafted ready from the combine program earlier in the year. And you're going to have vets, you know, going into their second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year, sixth year, seventh year, eighth year. I think we have some guys this off season who will be in their 10th, going into their 10th year in the NFL, um, which is, you know, these are high, these are really high stakes. You know, how do we manage load in real time? How do we help, um, you know, rehab and return to play after 10 years of, 
uh, you know, playing in the NFL. And this is where your decisions really matter. And we want the decisions to matter. So people think about the decisions that they make. So level three was, you know, wasn't just going to be another anatomy biomechanics course where you learn some information. It's like, no, 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 you guys know enough now know what matters. And so that's level three is, you know, it's giving exposure to what I think to be the best academically, the best coaches in the world, giving them exposure to the best athletes in the world. And, um, you know, it's, it's something where it's not necessarily a pass fail, but it's like, Hey, these are things that we're going to work on either from the hard sciences or the soft skills. And there's going to be a team of uh, instructors that are overseeing their coaching. And it's, it's going to be fun. You know, we get to, it's always good when you're in a room with some of the freakiest athletes on the planet and, you know, we can talk about the decisions that we make in in open space. And that's where like the real learning comes from. And it's six days in Tampa, Florida, um, we run this year, we'll run fo- four cohorts, two have already sold out for January and February. The second two will be the end of June, and that'll be open to level two students um, in March and April for sale. Um, but yeah, that's, it's, it's, yeah it's, a, it's a purposeful point of differentiation to make it so that people that um, you know, are aligned with us and the brand and me as coaches uh, as educated coaches can also actually bring it on the gym floor. And we thought what better way to do that in a super high stakes situation where people are making tens of millions of dollars and your decisions actually matter. So, and it's a great, uh, it's a great asset for these players who have coaches now who are, you know, theoretically very, uh, theoretically and academically very inclined and in great positions to make better decisions for them. So it's, it's a, it's a win-win. That's um that's great. I mean, congratulations on not building such a platform, but I mean, a community of educators and and um, I guess a whole team of trainers who probably now have a greater sense of direction and where they can go with such a broad field in the in this industry. Um, Jordan, where can people uh, find you in um, social media or anything? Yeah, uh, easiest probably Instagram at the underscore muscle underscore doc. Um, find all the education stuff, L1, L2, all of that, uh, www.pre-script.com. And then podcast, iTunes, Spotify is at uh, RX Radio. Um, so, yeah, um, that's basically where you'll find me is either on the website, my Instagram, or on the podcast. Great content on, on either of them. Uh, I'll make sure to put those, uh, the link in the descriptions as well as uh, the prescript website for people who are interested in, you know, becoming certified in level one, level two, and, you know, hopefully level three, if they get to that. Um, thank Big you so trust. much, Dr. Jordan Shallow for coming on very informational. Uh, hopefully people would have gained a, uh, gained a better perspective on warming up and, you know, a lot of other ways to go about such a ver so, such a variety, you know, of different options that they can do. Or get a better get get a bigger picture. I think that's a good way to say it. Of it. Um, uh, thank you guys for listening, and I will see you guys in the next podcast.